I say recognize quite a few of the names which are popping up on the uh, on the attendees list. <laughs> A lot of people saying hello from Belgium, Italy, South London, Arizona, Munich, some Somerset in UK, Wisconsin, Luxor, England, Canada. Wow, it's such a universal audience. <laughs> hello, everyone. Spain, Israel. Some of the cities, I'm afraid if I'm gonna pronounce them, I'm gonna completely destroy them. So, okay. <laughs> okay. I think. Okay. Okay, shall we start? We have so far 101 attendees. Okay, good evening, everyone. And welcome to our virtual book talk tonight with our esteemed professor, Aidan Dotson. Um, uh, let me just introduce uh, Professor Aidan quickly. I'm sure most of you are very aware of uh, his biography and his works. Uh, honorary Professor uh, Aidan Dotson is a professor of Egyptology in the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Bristol, UK. He was the Simpson Professor of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo in 2013. And he's the chair of the Egypt Exploration Society between 2011 and 2016. He was awarded his PhD by the University of Cambridge in 2003, and he was elected as a fellow of the Society of Anthropology. Antiquaries of London in 2003. He is the author of over 20 books, and he is the author of our uh, series, Pharaohs, uh, Their Lives and Afterlives. Um, this is the fourth book in the series, the first Pharaohs, Their Lives and Afterlives. And the series included the titles about Stephanie the First, Ramses the Third, and Nefertiti. This talk is supposed to last about an hour. We're gonna start with the talk of Dr. Uh, Professor Aiden. And we're going to open the floor to some Q&A, which you can send here in the Q&A box. And he will reply to them as much as he can. We're also uh, broadcasting this talk live on our Facebook page, the American University in Cairo Press. And you can send your questions there as well. And we're going to moderate them and send them here to Dr. Aid. Um, this uh, recording of the event is going to be available after the event is over on our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel. So please don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box after the talk. Thank you. Professor Aiden, the floor is yours now to talk about the first pair of their lives and afterlives. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Suzanne. Um, nice to be here, or wherever here is for, for you around the world. Um, as, as, you, as Suzanne said, this is the fourth book in the series of Lives and Afterlives. And it's the first one which is dealing with more than just one particular um, individual. Um, the fifth book in the series is being proofread at the moment and should be going to the press in a few weeks. And that is going to be on to Tanchamun, so back to doing a single, um, a single pharaoh, uh, which is rather an unashamedly attempt to tie in with the centenary of discovery of the tomb. Though one hopes that the, um, the approach I will take is slightly different from most of the other things which are likely to be coming out uh, next year on it. First, just to say, to sort of talk a little bit about the background to the whole concept of the series. The concept really came about almost by accident when the first volume, um, set the setting, the first one, was being put together, because really the the brief for writing that was effectively. Uh, oops. Okay. 
happen there. Um, the sorry about that. So I think there's suddenly it said the recording had stopped. So something had obviously gone gone funny. Anyway, I'm just going back. Yeah. The, the, the series um, of the the lives and afterlives came back slightly um, by accident in the sense that originally I was it was hinted that it'd be nice to write a book on City of the First and his tomb, and that that would be well received. So I did that. But in developing how I was going to do that, the idea of linking somebody's life's life with their tomb and their afterlife, that extended to the idea of thinking about the afterlife, not just in purely in theological terms, so you know, what does the decoration of the king's tomb um, mean, but also what is their existence after their death in this world, in the sense, how are they remembered? How do their um, descendants regard them? And then how does history regard them? Both in ancient times when there's still some kind of link with them. Um, and also then in modern times, after the great gulf of the, um, the point where, you, where hieroglyphs could no longer be understood, um, the, the move of Egypt to, from paganism to Christianity and then on to Islam, all those kinds of things. So how were they rediscovered by modern scholarship after perhaps nearly 2000 years of being utterly forgotten? And so that idea has been further developed in the latest, in the later volumes. And in the case of the first pharaohs, that's the first one which actually deals with a whole swathe of individuals rather than just the one, just the one king or one queen. The balance between life and afterlife is possibly more even more skewed than in the um, original um, volumes, because what we actually have from the first pharaohs, and from the, I talk about the first pharaohs, we're talking about those from the unification of Egypt around about 3100, 3000 or so BC, uh, for the next or three centuries down to the end of the third um, Egyptian dynasty is extremely um, tenuous, the amount of material which survives from their time. Um, and indeed, until the 1890s, we didn't even really sure they any, even, even, any of them even existed outside the works of later historiographers. So in many ways, the, say, the, the afterlife, how we actually rediscovered these people is a really quite a crucial part of, of, of the book and as an important part of, of writing it. Because it's also in many ways so, um, a, a case study in historiography, but how historians actually work and how they manage to um, identify individuals, what might have happened to them and so on and so forth. Now with earlier people who um, I've written books on in this series, particularly Seti the First and uh, Ramesses the Third. Extensive um, texts from their time were put on the walls of temples, and those wall, those temple walls still stand today. So that once hieroglyphs could be um, read with some degree of of confidence, which happens during the second quarter of the 19th century AD. These individuals fairly rapidly jump out and become solid individuals. And then, okay, further discoveries are made over the following um, decades and, uh, and so on. But they really just flesh out the, the fact that we know these people, who these people are. And it's just a question of getting more, more data. However, if we're sitting in the late um, 1820s, which is really when just after hieroglyphs are deciphered for the first time, we have got a situation whereby all we have, well, it's, there are, there's a king list is discovered in, 20, in um, 1819, but unfortunately the first part is broken away and therefore you only have got an official list from ancient times available to early historians ranging from the Middle Kingdom, from the 12th dynasty basically, through until this particular king list was written under Ramesses II. And therefore it was possible with that, this sort of crib, and also the classical work of Manetho, a king list written in, uh, in Greek, 
for these early historians to be able to start looking at the monuments, particularly those um, around Luxor, and spot cartouches, slot them into the, into, into, the, into the list of kings, and be able to flesh things out quite nicely, as I'll be discussing very much in my in the, in the Trunk Moon volume, did to a certain degree in Nefertiti, there are problems because there are points where kings are written out of history and so on. But in big handfuls, it was possible for these early historians, particularly Sir John Gardner Wilkinson, who really should be held up, I think, as the real pioneer of the reconstruction of the history of ancient Egypt. When he is working at the end of the 1820s in his books written in 1828 and 1830, he's able to produce a chronicle of Egyptian history going back to the 12th dynasty, which although different, you know, there's lots of things which differ from how we would view it now, but the basic picture to him seems fairly clear and it all ties in. Prior to that, however, the king list is broken away and no king list which confidently goes back to the beginning of Egyptian history, the unification of Egypt around 3000 BC, that's not, they're not available until the 1860s. So that, that sort of crib isn't, isn't easily available. However, it's possible from standalone monuments for historians to, cr to claw their way back into the Old Kingdom, the Great Pyramid Building era, and there are enough standing monuments and things which are sort of linked together um, to allow, allow them to get themselves back to the beginning of the Fourth Dynasty. So just as the Great Pyramids are starting to be built, Snefru, Khufu, Khafre, Menkaure, and all those. So it was possible for those, for that history to be written, or at least a proto version of it. But then the problem was what to do prior to Snefru. So after that, you've got pyramids, you've got tombs, royal names, and things. It's, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's doable. What all that was available to these early, early um, proto historians was Manetho's list of pharaohs, which had Greek forms going back to the unification of Egypt under the legendary Menes. Actually, Menes, there was some basis for um, uh, thinking he was real in the sense that in a couple of New Kingdom monuments, he is shown as an ancestral king along with people like Monterotep II and Achmosa Ahmo, I. So clearly in the New Kingdom, somebody could, this, this Menes, who is there in Herodotus and in, in Manetho is, is somebody. But what about the rest of the names? They really have, all they, they only exist within the purview of, um, of Manetho's work. And there's nothing which, of actual ancient Egypt, which any of these early um, Egyptologists are able to um, tie together. And that's even still the case when the king lists of Seti I, Abydos, and the king list of Saqqara are found by um, Auguste Mariette in the 1850s um, and 60s. They do indeed have a whole long list of going back, which can be compared with Manetho's, including going back to the unification of Egypt, and even mention, well, one of them mentions Menes as the founder of ancient Egypt. But still, the archaeologists had nothing to go on as far as trying to work out whether these people existed or not. And as late as the 1890s, uh, Flinders Petrie is saying that actually he's not even sure these people, uh, Flinders Petrie, um, important pioneering Egyptolog British Egyptologist who worked in Egypt from 1880 onwards. But even the mid in 1894, Petrie is saying, I'm not even sure these people exist. Um, there's absolutely no um, solid evidence for them. Uh, there's no, 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 virtually no material which we can identify from this period. And he wonders whether they're simply the sort of legendary ancestor kings you find in so many cultures. He mentioned legendary um, king, early kings of Ireland, for example. Um, in Britain, there's also a king list which runs back to Brutus in the time of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Trojan Wars. 
so, so we did, and then there's no, this, these, some of these people existed. So he wonders whether or not actually somebody, presumably around the time of Snefford, a little bit before that, had invented these people as ancestors. Which, yeah, let's say, plenty of other examples. For example, um, the numbering of the modern, modern Swedish kings, which is sort of, you know, quite high, is all due to them assuming that some of these legendary people who never existed actually existed. So hence the reason why I've got a, a Gustav the Fourteenth on the throne of, of Sweden at the moment. He should actually be like Ram, he should be something like Gustav the Eighth or something. So this is so it is a, a thing. This kind of invention of antiquity. But then, interestingly enough, only almost the same year that Petrie was writing this rather despairing view that before Snefru, it's all it's all you know, it may not even exist. That they start discovering things which can be placed that early. Um, there's a discovery of what may, there's a debated point, may be a contemporary mention of the name Menes, um, found in a tomb dis discovered um, at, Nagar at Nagada, which around the same sort of time was yielding what turned out to be the first prehistoric burials from Egypt. Although in the absence of any information of what happened prior to Snefru, the initial thought by Petrie, who excavated them, was that these graves were actually first intermediate period, which was the uh, period where at that stage we knew absolutely nothing archaeologically. Um, and then as the decade progressed, more and more things started being found. Eugène Amelino um, excavated at Omel Garb at um, Abydos and found what turned out to be the tombs of the kings of the first dynasty, who could, some of whom could be tied in with names on the king lists. The problem with the king lists was that they gave the names in cartouches, but cartouches weren't invented until late in the third dynasty. So to some degree, these cartouches were made up because all later kings had on these king lists had cartouches. Some of them, we still have no idea where these people who were probably putting this together, probably in the fifth dynasty, we think, um, when the first sort of these, these, these first sort of um, chronicles are being produced. Um, but a couple of them do actually resemble some of the name Horus or Nebti names uh, they were using at the time. And so therefore it was possible to um, tie some of those in. And gradually, um, when Petrie, who now believed in prehistory and so on, having then excavated some first intermediate period gray um, cemetery and found nothing similar to these, to what turned out to be prehistoric things, he and then re-excavated re at Abydos sort of by the 1901. So li literally only six or seven years from the point of view where Petrie is, is despairing and saying it's all, it's all too horrible. We have a complete list of kings from the beginning of the first dynasty through to the early second dynasty. And then we have a, couple, a, a number of other kings who clearly fit in somewhere after that. But, it, but it's interesting that we have got this, the, the first dynasty is, is absolutely rock solid chronologically and historically. We've got all the names. There is still some debate over who Menes actually is. Is it Hor Aha or, or is it Anama? But that's a minor issue. Otherwise we've got the whole lot. Interestingly enough, as we then move forward in time, it all gets fairly murky again, because the second and third dynasties even looking at the king lists, they all disagree. There is, whereas there's pretty well so, rock solid agreement between the um, first dynasty lists, except there's a question about say whether there's an extra king at the beginning who is Menes or not between a couple of the lists. But the lists all disagree with each other. And although some of the individuals on those lists can be firmly identified, particularly famous Joza, Netriquet, as he was called during his lifetime, the builder of the step pyramid at Saqqara, he's, you know, he's a fairly solid, a, a solid thing there. Although it took a bit of time to actually work that bit out, because for a long time the step pyramid was, the, was recognised as the oldest known building from ancient Egypt, but exactly where it fitted was unclear. Some theorised it was first dynasty, some second dynasty and so on. Some even thought it was um, the um, 
a burial place for apis bulls um, at, one, at one point. So that was all, but again, by the end of the 19th century, that was, that was fully placed. However, so there is, st there is still a, a great big gaping hole in the middle of the second dynasty where the severe lack of material. Um, and also the third dynasty is still very, very messy. We can probably identify pyramids for all kings of the third dynasty. Necessarily who they are is rather more, is slightly more problematic. And there's probably more excavation required to be able to sort out the third dynasty. Uh, for example, there is a remarkable monument not far from Abu Roash, it's on the way on to the, to the Western Delta um, called Eder, which may be a third dynasty step pyramid but has never has not been excavated since 1930s, and nobody really understood what it was. They thought then it was a Middle Kingdom fortress. Um, it also has been partly covered over by Coptic material, but that's something which desperately needs um, desperately needs, uh, needs um, re-excavating because everything about it says Third Dynasty royal tomb, yet it's brick. So anyway, that's something to. Um, that's something which I do raise in the book, that that's, that's what, now, sort of a gaping hole in our knowledge um, about, the, um, about those royal tombs. And in the second dynasty, we have this hole in the middle of it. We know that something funny is happening because one of the kings doesn't have a Horus name, like all other kings, he has a set name. And then at the very end of the dynasty, we have a king with a Horus and set name. Now, of course, the legend has Horus and Set as enemies. It has been questioned whether or not though that, um, that, that um, theological enmity may have some kind of link in an actual sort of civil war between people who follow Horus, those who follow Set, possibly during the Second Dynasty. And an idea was put back, put forward a hundred years ago, um, that the, the, the full version of the legend of Horus and Set, which is in the Edfu temple, um, might actually be a fictionalized, theologicized, if that's a word, um, version of a real civil war, which took place um, during that, that, that period. Um, but the very fact there is such a that there is disagreement between the um, king lists and also actually some of the king lists have a king whose name is actually Lakuna when you translate it. So it's clearly something which an early Egyptian historian, when they were providing a king list, found this term Hujefa, which means means Lakuna missing hole is a hole in the in the original document. When these things get transmitted further on, somebody thinks this term is actually named the king. And so we end up on the, uh, in the king list on the walls of Seti the First Temple at um, Abydos, a cartouche with the word missing in the middle uh, or lacuna in it, which again is an interesting, interesting example of how, of how history um, gets transmitted um, and how things which are, are not, not people who are not actually people then um, sort of appear as a, as a name. So, so it's, a fascin it's a fascinating thing. And hence that's the reason why the, the chunk of the first pharaohs, which is, which I call resurrection, and also actually limbo as well, which is the bit which is after them, is actually probably more extensive than in any of the other volumes of, of the series, simply because there is so much interesting stuff going on about how these are these individuals are identified in modern times, but also some of the interesting stuff which is going on with them in ancient times as well, because we find, particularly in very late times, in, Tol in the Ptolemaic period on into the Roman period, some of these very very early individuals are brought out as a means of almost confirming the present. For example, there's, a famous, there's the famous famine stealer at Sahel, in which Joza, builder of the Step Pyramid, and Imhotep, who um, was his senior official, generally thought of as the architect, though he never holds the actual title of architect, well, they're brought out in a story about a famine thousands of years before the stealer is actually carved, which is carved in the Ptolemaic period in the third century BC. But 
here they are in a, a story which is actually ultimately to do with why the, the priests of Knum at Elephantini in the Ptolemaic period shouldn't have to pay any taxes. But it's, there's a whole story around this which um, is, is put, is set in the time of the uh, being the Third Dynasty as to show this has all happened a long time ago and this is why it's always been like this. And also actually some of one of the very obscure kings from the uh, end of the Second Dynasty during this possible civil war period, uh, Nefakau Sokka, who is completely without any kind of contemporary um, evidence for his existence, he just appears in the king list. He also appears in very, very late um, literature as the um, involving um, a, a manual for temple building, and also in there, there's a seven year famine is mentioned in, which is also in, in, in the famine stealer. So there's a number of tropes which are used, certainly from in the Ptolemaic and Roman periods, possibly as earlier as well, which are set back here. So there is some, so it, it, it's a remote past where you can um, conjure up the origins. So far in the past, that it's almost beyond anybody's ability to be able to you know, say whether it's actually, maybe it's actually real or real or not. And again, if you're looking in terms of um, historiography in, in in the UK, King Arthur is is often sort of cited as some kind of origin for a thing, and that's again that all that all that all that all ties in with late with, with the later periods using the past as a confirmation for what, they, what they're trying to do there. And another thing about this sort of grasping of the past can be seen a bit earlier in the Third Intermediate Period, when we find some reliefs of King Azorkon IV at Tarnis. Azorkon IV is sort is about 720 or so BC, give or, give or take a bit. Um, he has reliefs which are indistinguishable from those of the third dynasty and in fact if his name wasn't actually on the reliefs one might even think they were of the third dynasty indeed when some of these reliefs were first found which had not got the names on them they'd been the breaking they were proclaimed to be real third dynasty things it was only when a few years ago the team working at Tarnis found some with the royal, with the actual royal name on them it suddenly became clear that these were actually they're not 2600 BC, Third Dynasty, they're actually something around 750, 720 or so BC. But, and this, you know, is quite a remarkable thing. But then we find that when, when the Step Pyramid was excavated in the 1920s and 30s, it was found that the interior had been entered at some point much later than the original um, pyramid by cutting complete new entrance galleries, not just simply sort of sneaking, but actually going in like that, and then gridding some of the reliefs, which were then clearly being copied one for one. And these then probably can be, can be traced back to, to the origins of these things of Azorkon IV. So this, this is a period, the time of Azorkon IV is a period of great, um, trouble in Egypt. There's civil wars, all sorts of stuff going on. It's, it's around the time when the Kushites are taking over as well. Um, and actually like the, the book after Tutankhamun is going to be on the Kushite pharaohs of Egypt. So, um, but anyway, there, and so the way of trying to sort of make things better is to try and sort of dump the bad stuff going on in the current period of time and go back to a purer time. So not only do we find copies being made of reliefs which are nearly 2000 years old, but also royal titularies are being revised to be more like the old kingdom or more like the, um, or more like the middle kingdom, all sorts of things. So, the, so there's so a kind of important theme in the latter part of this book is the use of the past by, yeah, by, by in, ancient, in ancient times, as well as we find, of course, we find similar kinds of things happening in more recent times as well about this use of the past. 
so those are some of the sort of th those are some of those kinds of quite important um, themes which I develop in the second part of the book. Anyway, the first part of the book it attempts to be as straight as possible a narration of what we know, or what we think we know about the early history of Egypt, starting just before the unification and then running through to the accession of Snefru, where, as Petrie recognised, things become much, much clearer. Has he emphasised that, as with any kind of history writing, this is more a work, this is, this, is, this is presenting a working hypothesis rather than claiming any of this is actually true. That's always a big problem with writing history, particularly once you're getting back into what, we, what I would call the early literate societies, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and so on and so forth. Where a lot, where almost every point is a matter of sort of debate rather than a matter of fact, and that a working hypothesis which looks fine at the moment can be completely derailed by a one one single discovery. In the early dynastic period, first dynasty, first couple of dynasties, this question about who Menes is, who Menes is, is an issue. Um, it also it, it, the actual um, written material keys in with purely archaeological material from the end of prehistory as well. So exactly how Egypt is, what the mode is of the unification of Egypt remains an issue. Is it a violent takeover of the north by the south? Is it a much more gradual thing with a final sort of violent, violent element to it or what? So I've had to sort of just, you know, I explore some of those various options. As I say, the first dynasty is really reasonably rock solid as far as the succession is concerned. We've got tombs of everybody. Um, okay, relationships, not necessarily something we can really um, talk much about, but we've got a fair amount of data. Then we skid into the second dynasty, starts off okay. We've got a couple of really impressive tombs at Saqqara because important point about the beginning of the second dynasty is the royal cemetery shifts from Abydos where it seems to have been going back into pre dynastic times at Saqqara near the city of Memphis which legendarily is said to be, have been founded by Menes and certainly the earliest tombs in Saqqara adjacent to it which is established as the cemetery of Memphis are the reign of Aha who might be Menes or might be many as a successor. So all that sort of works. And so then we get the whole of this civil war, Set versus Horus, whatever's going on there. Then we get reunification and the Chasekamwi, who goes back to Abydos, has also had Set, had um, the Set King Peribsen, which interesting given that Abydos is later, at least the city of Osiris. And then, or then everything should be tidied up. Resources, technology has got to a point where the step pyramid can be built by um, Josa. So then it all falls apart again. Though whether that's a genuine falling apart or simply a lot of short reigns so that the pyramid building or royal tomb building, which remains the bedrock for our contemporary material from this period, um, Aren't, aren't completed and therefore the data isn't isn't there. So I think that's sort of a, a, my a, my basic sort of overview of what what the book's about and some of the key themes which I think were, were important in in writing it. And I'm therefore happy I think to take questions from this point onwards. Although some of the my answers may then veer off into slightly longer uh, longer statements if it's okay. if they sort of tie in with other themes within the book or or elsewhere but we're still sure that they're going to be as interesting as this talk so um if anyone has any questions please send them over in the q and a box and we share them with aiden but first uh, uh, professor aiden i'd like to ask you so you kind of mentioned it briefly uh, on your next project that's part of the series as well. Could you like uh, to give us some information about uh, the upcoming books? Yeah, let's say, well, the next, the next one in the, in the series is going to be on Tutankhamun. Um, 
and that should be out this time next year. It's, it's, it's currently, it's written, it's with my proofreaders and therefore the press should have it as soon as I'm, as probably by, by the new year. Um, Anyway, anyway, so therefore that should be out, and so and that very much is say it's although it's a say next year there's going to be huge numbers of books on Tadakh Hamoun, yeah. but, but I'm I hope that taking the approach I do with very much the historiography, um, that will make it slightly different from the uh, from from the usual things. And from my point of view, the discovery of Tutankhamun isn't 1922 with Howard Carter finding the tomb. It's actually 1828 with Gardner Wilkinson, who I already mentioned, first noting he even existed and then trying to make sense of where he fitted into history. And um, there's some quite, he came up with some quite bizarre solutions. Well, we think they're bizarre now, but according to the, the, you know, the, the, the times, they weren't. Um, no, for example, that he, they, he thought that he'd actually left Egypt and, be, and found in the city of Argos in Greece. Now, that all sounds quite weird, but actually, if you follow the evidence which was available to him in 1828, that's, so that's something to, to look forward to about how Tutankhamun was thought at one point to have found the city of Argos. Um, after that, there's two. I've got two more uh, volumes in the series which are under under contract with AUC Press at the moment. One is the Nubian Pharaohs of Egypt, which is going to be looking at the 25th dynasty. There's another grouping of kings, and that's another interesting one from the point of view of sort of how the, the how Nubia and Egypt have interacted over time. But also, there's some very interesting stuff around the um, historiography. Of that particular period, so this is the the, the, the latter part, um, as to how um, various European um, Egyptologists were desperate to try and avoid having to admit that they they these people were black Africans, um, all the, all sorts of weird and wonderful trying to get around that. So some really interesting stuff around the around that, and then the final volume so far is going, which hopefully these are all one year, one year, one year. But the final volume I've got under contract at the moment is Thutmose the Third and Hatshepsut. Oh, Where, wow. Um, again, actually, it's going to be quite interesting trying to distill them down into the standard length we've got, because the book, this series, is aimed to be no more than that 50,000 words. So it's going to be quite interesting trying to, to distill these two characters. And also the historiography, because, of course, the historiography of Hatshepsut is, you know, is, is fascinating. So that's going to be quite, that you know, in, in some ways writing a shorter book is more difficult than writing a longer one because you've really got to work out what matters and what doesn't matter. So that's the that's how we've got it so far. I'm thinking about whether there should be other things in the in the in the series. Um, the, the key point about the series, though, is that you ne one needs to have some useful afterlifey stuff. So they've got to have a decent tomb, a decent tomb to talk about, decent memorial temple to talk about, and there's also be something worthwhile about the histo about the historiography. So, and at the moment, trying to find, and also people I'm actually, I've got research, research interests in as well. There's also a degree of that, that I don't, I don't, haven't really done a huge amount of work in directly on the middle or old kingdoms. So I probably wouldn't necessarily want to do any individuals of those periods because I don't feel I'd be adding anything new, to, anything original to the, to, the, to the picture. I think if one is writing a book on, so, you know, on, a de on a detailed period, it should be something one has got original research interests in rather than just simply you know, putting out, just, just writing it uh, for the sake of writing it. So that's the, that's the series as it stands at the moment. And I'm trying to twist the arms of a number of colleagues to write books in the series on people I don't necessarily want to want want to write about, or I don't feel myself as capable of writing about. So there may be a couple of other 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 ones in the series um, which may emerge, which aren't which aren't by me. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, this uh, wonderful answer. We're very excited about the rest of the books in the series, and we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first question is. How are the early pyramids identified as to whom were the kings that created them? With great difficulty, I think is probably the answer. With a couple, well, the, the key ones we're talking about are those of the third dynasty. 
And one can start off by being happy that they are third dynasty by looking at the architecture. Egyptian architecture does tend to be reasonably evolutionary. And we've got the step pyramid nicely there at the beginning of the third dynasty. We know that Joseph is the direct successor of Kasekamwi. So we've got a starting point. We've also got a finishing point, which is the pyramids of Snefru at the beginning of the fourth dynasty. And so looking at these monuments in purely in architectural terms, one can place them in a fairly reasonable order. Um, for example, so after Snef, after Joza, one can probably place um, Sechem Ket's pyramid directly after him, architecturally position wise. And also the fact there is a graffito, a builder's graffito on the enclosure wall of Sechem Ket's pyramid that um, seems to mention Imhotep. So he may have been the architect of that one as well. Also, as far as that pyramid is concerned, is that an inscription found on an item in the tomb reads Joza T, and the king lists, as far as although they are somewhat problematic, they seem to be fairly clear that Joza T was the successor of Joza, and that Second Ket is the Horus name of Joza T just as Necheket is the Horus name of Joza. So we're okay at the very beginning of all that. Then we have two pyramids, which are rather, it's one of three monuments, which are a bit of an, are an issue. If we go to the end of the sequence to start with, there is the brick pyramid at Abu Roash. This isn't the pyramid of Abu Roash of, of Jedef Ray people may be familiar with. It's actually one which was originally made of brick. The brick was still, some of the brick was still visible in the 19th century, uh, but was then taken away as Sibach, fertilizer um, by, by local villagers. Um, and all that's left is the rock, is, is, is a freestanding rock knoll, which was the core. Um, and when you look at the design of the underground passageway, which is carved into that, the only place that will fit chronologically is at the very end, directly before the fourth dynasty, because things which happen to the design of underground parts of, of, of royal tombs. So that can be placed there and can probably be associated with Huni, the last king of the third dynasty, um, not because of any inscriptions, but because Huni is the last king, this this structure can only be placed at the end of the third dynasty so ergo it must be the tomb of Huni. Then in the between you've got two other monuments neither of which have actually got any kind of immediate way of um, identifying. One is this thing the Elder near um, Abu Roash which I talked about before which appears to be a mud brick version of the step pyramid almost insofar as the extremely limited uh, amount of um, work which is done on it. This is, has been done. Um, you can actually get a certain amount by actually looking at it, it uh, with Google Earth, and I've actually got the Google Earth picture of it in the, um, in the book, um, along with um, a, a ground level photograph which a friend of mine very kind, kindly took because I realised I needed it right in the middle of the COVID. Of COVID. So very, uh, I'm, I'm very, very, a friend was very, very generous in being prepared to get drive out there and take a picture for me. So. Uh, that's, that was great. Um, so, but that, by its very nature, it has to be in the middle of the Third Dynasty because there's nowhere else you can put some, a monument like that because they change completely at the end of the Third Dynasty. Hence, I've so that could be Sanachti, who is one of the kings in the middle of the dynasty without a monument, without it, without a tomb. So, Sanachti. And then finally, you've got the layer pyramid which architecturally should be placed fairly soon after Second Ketz. Some um, stone bowls found nearby had the name of King Chaba, who is otherwise unknown. As a tomb near a pyramid may well have the name of the owner of the pyramid on it, it's assumed Chaba, and therefore Chaba has been assumed to be at that point in the Third Dynasty. But see, it's all pretty clutching at straws to some degree. Um, and all those tombs are described in fully in the in the book with photographs, plans and everything else. So uh, yes, I think this answered the second question. So are you also describing the tombs? I saw the other question coming up for her might as well just answer that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's full sets of plans, photographs and so on. And 
they're all in pretty well all in full color, which is one of the other up, so, uh, great things that the press actually allowed me to have full color in a book on history, which isn't common. Um, so full, yeah, all those, all the tombs, full color. Okay, I have another question. How much information on the early pharaohs is still unpublished and more difficult to get? I think most of the data which we are aware of has been published. Um, but things which possibly, you know, this idea that Eldare is certainly an issue uh, um, where that hasn't been touched since 1930 when Rascala Makramala um, worked on it. Um, but I think, I think most of the stuff, most of the material, it has been published. It's a question of assimilating it and trying to work out what it all means. That's half the problem. A lot of work is going on, um, particularly the German work at, um, at um, Abydos has revealed new evidence. Although the Royal Tombs of Abydos have been excavated now, this is the third time they've been excavated, uh, more data keeps on coming out, particularly with more skilled modern um, archaeology uh, being thrown at it. So I think most of the, mo except for stuff which is like coming out of the ground like yesterday, a lot of the materials, it's a lot of it, the problem is actually making clear what it all means. That's the bit, the interpretation is perhaps the most difficult bit. Uh, another question, uh, did early uh, hieroglyphs have a phonetic component? If not, how are the names of the early pharaohs is known? Well, as far as we can tell anyway, the earliest hieroglyphs are effectively the same hieroglyphs as we have later on. There's certainly the uh, repertoire is by no means as rich, there are far less of them, but as far as one can tell, they are all, pretty well all the early ones are recognisable as later ones. And on that basis, we have assumed that the pronunciation of those signs hasn't changed fundamentally before we get to a, a much more stable version of, um, of high, the hieroglyphics texts and the language early in the fourth dynasty. There has, so now there have, was a point where people were trying to interpret some of the early names, like the um, a king whose let, name is written with a hand and the water sign. Mo, initially that was read as den because the hand is the D, the water sign is the N, and that's generally what we do today. But there was a thought in sort of in the 20th century of trying to in, import, right, um, interpret this as the as picture writing for water pourer, so udimu. So you'll find in books, particularly written in the middle of the 20th century, talking about King Udimu, who in earlier and later books you find as King Den. So. Yeah, it's it, we're making an assumption that things didn't change significantly. They probably, and I, I think it's unlikely they would change, given that the basic meaning, the basic values of hieroglyphs remained fairly unchanged from the fourth dynasty down to the Roman period. So one assumes these proto ones are what they, you know, what they appear to be. Okay, another question. Um, someone's saying thanks for the talk. So yes. And besides the Second Dynasty Civil War, what other evidence of warfare have you identified for the early dynastic period? Well, there's certainly, um, well, for example, some of the some of the labels which were found at Abydos, which are to do with, um, I doubt, I, I, we seem to we seem to be identifying years and things. There are some which show smiting. There's a figure of Den who is shown bashing the head of somebody who is uh, labeled as an Easterner. Um, so, and, and also in, and also of course you've got the Dharma Nama Palace as well, where you've got the smiting of potentially uh, menes of Northern foes as well. So there's, and also there down in, the, in, in the Nubia, there is at the Sheikh Soliman, a relief which has, seems to be um, some kind of conquest of Nubia early in the first dynasty. And in the Sinai, at the, um, at the mines at Wadi Mahara um, in central Sinai, the, the third dynasty monuments, a lot of them have a king smiting an enemy. So clearly uh, violence and warfare is, there, is, is baked into to, you know, what makes a king right from, from the very outset. And also there are, there is sort of some things which appear to be um, remains of weapons and things in tombs as well. So it, it sounds like it was quite a, 
um, quite a, you know, it was a violent time. Um, and then suddenly, if we've also got these civil wars, so it looks as though things that, one well, of the reasons probably why the material we have increases massively under Snefru is that's when finally the aggravation which had been occurring in the previous years had finally gone away, at least for the time being anyway. Uh, there's a couple more questions. Uh, I hope we can have like a couple of minutes to answer them. Um, uh, we have a question, was Norma or Aha the first pair from your point of view? I think it's, it depends what you, what you mean by the first pharaoh. I think on balance, one can argue that um, Nama is probably Menes, um, in which case he is the first, that would count, he counts as that. I think whether or not he is Menes, I think he counts as the first person one can identify as having at least a claim to the rule over the whole of the country. So I think Nama is probably it. Uh, another question. Uh, some you notice in this new Aiden's book about the site of the burials of the kings of Second Dynasty before Beripsen and I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Kasechemwe <laughs> in Omel Kab. Uh, thanks, Aiden, Susan, AC. Yeah, well, but yeah, basically, I would I'd, I'd discuss the, the two um, tombs at Saqqara, the ones of Hatep Sekhemwe, the um, founder of the dynasty, and then um, Ninetcha, the third king of the dynasty at, um, at, at Saqqara. So yeah, that's, um, and then we say, as I was saying, that we then get this reversion to Abidas before a reversion back to Saqqara again at the beginning of the third dynasty. But say pretty well, all the royal tombs which we know of or can reasonably attribute to the uh, first three dynasties are covered. Okay, good. Um... Another question, how far can modern technologies allow us to fill in gaps in our knowledge of the early rulers, which can currently be filled on the basis of inscriptions or sequence data? Tricky actually, um, because um, the, 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 the pluses and minuses on dating of things by scientific methods, e.g. Um, carbon-14, are often in excess of what one can do by dead reckoning on more historic grounds. Also, they, they actually, the carbon-14 dates for the late prehistory, early dynastic period, are, are, are rather all over the place. They're not particularly consistent. So I'm not sure really how much of new technologies can have a massive impact on changing how we interpret things. Where, where modern technology does come in is through things like remote sensing, allowing us to survey sites and have a much better, more, more, more um, targeted means of, um, of, fire, of, 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 of directing archaeological effort than, we, than, than was previously the case. Um, excavation, gets increasingly expensive as time goes by and um, being able to, to actually only, only dig where there is something which is probably worthwhile. So I think probably that's where the modern technology is most useful is in finding sites and, and appropriate sites. And it's from, that from finding new sites, we might get more information. And we have a question from one of our followers on Facebook. She's asking, uh, what is a dynasty and how long is it? Okay, what's it? right. Um, a dynasty is simply a, 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 what appears to be a royal family, a, a royal house. Nowadays, we talk about the Royal House of Windsor, there's been Imperial House of Hohenzollern, Ra um, Romanov and so on. So really all, and that's their effectively what dynasties are. They're royal, they're, they're groups of, um, kings or queens who belong to the same basic family. The dynastic system we use in Egypt goes back to Manetho, who was writing in the fourth century, in third century BC. He produces a king list and divides it up into 30 numbered dynasties. And those dynasties are roughly are basically equivalent to various the rarest modern royal and imperial houses. Um, how far a dynasty is 
how far he got it right is un, it's not always clear. Although some of the di di divisions between dynasties, although they're not numbered as such, can be traced back to pharaonic period um, king lists. And certainly some of them, like the first dynasty, because everybody is buried in the same location and so on, that helps suggest that is a real, a real sequence. And then as we move later in time, we of course actually know the genealogies of later dynasties. So we actually can tell that some of them are indeed a single royal family until there's a break in the royal line and we find a new one. So they are, that's basically what they are. How long they are very much depends on the dynasty. There are some which last centuries. There are some which have got one, are made up of one king. So um, yes, a dynasty is say it's, it's simply, it's like when we say talk about the Bourbons, the Hohenzollerns and all those sort of things. It's a convenient label, but one has to be quite careful about it. It's not as though, and often, it does, it does appear that art sort of changes as dynasties change. But of course, it wasn't the case that somebody wakes up one morning and says, oh, the 18th dynasty is over now. Which the 19th dynasty now. Let's, 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 let's carve things differently. It's, so we've got, it's, it's, what it's become is a convenient means of art by archaeologists to be able to say what things belong to, particularly because dating things to actual years BC can be is, is very problematic before about 700 um, BC. Prior to that, everything has to be calculated and estimated, and there can be a two or three hundred year differences between as you go if you go back far enough between different archaeologists' view of what something is. So it's far easier to say this is this is first dynasty rather than trying to say it's 31st century BC or 29th century BC. Um, do you think we can have a couple more questions? Um, was there any kind of law considering the treatment of enemies in the early dynasties? We have absolutely no idea. Um, all we know is that the number of kings were beating up enemies, but on what basis uh, we had absolutely no idea. Um, so it's, it's all much, much, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just too early and the texts are very much proto hieroglyphs. We don't really get proper narrative texts until the end of the third dynasty. Um, and even then when they talk about enemies, it's just saying they're enemies, they're nasty people who we should beat up. Okay. Uh, someone sent us a question earlier to the webinar and they said, uh, while working on this book uh, that's covering the first three dynasties of Pharaonic civilization, you must have come across some surprises. Anything you'd like to share? <laughs> surprises? Um, I don't know. I think some of the surprises come with some of the uh, with with the, with the historiography of it, um, and say the the very fact that as late as eighteen ninety four, you've got an authoritative statement that we know absolutely nothing about the, about the uh, the earliest dynasties. Um, and then, yet, then six years later, we've we actually got a complete. We've actually got the tombs of all most of them. We can you know, we've got a, an idea of some of the events and so on. So I think it's it's it's, it's not so much why I was writing the book, but when I first was getting into this period of Egyptology, and in fact, it's one of my oldest loves, going back to when I was a schoolboy. The early dynastic period was something which had always gri which had gripped me. It was that it was that early on realization. Of how rapidly our historical knowledge can change, and that went from zero to a you know, to a to a vet to a significant level, but also then is how that knowledge can change, say by just one by, by one one discovery. So I think that's the sort of it's it's really the the rapidity that what I was calling the working hypothesis can radically change. Okay, um, has anyone found uh, convincingly a tomb that can be represented as belonging to Menes? Several tombs found in Abydos were represented as candidates, but I interpret that as wishful thinking. I think the point is that Menes is either Nama or, or Aha, and both of them have got definitely identified tombs at Abydos. So the answer is 
yes, we have definitely got his tomb, but which one it is, we don't know. Okay, last question. Um, have you seen any evidence regarding uh, Kamos at the end of Dynasty 17? I hope I'm, I said the name right, I'm sorry. We're, we're, jumping, we're jumping a couple of thousand years later on this. The key de de evidence for him are his stele. The, um, the, the great stela, which is the intact stela, which is now in the Luxor Museum. And also there are fragments of a companion one. It's really annoying given how the, 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 one, the intact one gives an amazingly detailed account of his, um, his activities. The broken one clearly also did, but only about 10% of it su survives. So uh, if we can actually, if more of that, those fragments are ever found, that would make a huge difference. Uh, but actually for somebody who's a, who was, until discovery of this stealer was utterly obscure, and after the discovery of, of this stealer, he actually was remarkably well, uh, well known. Um, uh, so yes, it was, um, so anyway, that's the, the short bit is, we know quite a bit from this one stealer. Okay, um, I just would like to share the cover of the book with our attendees so they could have a look at it. Um, uh, I was supposed to have a copy with me, but unfortunately I had to do this event from home. Uh, so this is the cover of the book and I posted the links of where you can order uh, your copy from different online book retailers and major bookstores worldwide. Uh, it's just released uh, in the US and Egypt and very soon in a couple of days in the UK. Okay, um, Professor Aiden, I'd like to take this moment to thank you so much for this interesting talk. Uh, we're still getting questions, um, but I'm not sure if we have uh, enough time to answer everyone. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna forward them to you if you'd like to, to answer to our attendees yourself. Um, but I would like to thank also everyone for their time and joining us. Um, the recording of this live is gonna be available right after on our Facebook page, the American Press in Cairo Press, and on YouTube as well. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for Professor Aiden for your efforts and your time. Right, good night. And perhaps, perhaps see you all next year when Tadak Moon comes yes. out. Definitely, we're gonna arrange for this one. Inshallah, thank you everyone. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.